Hello, residents of Southern Franklin County. This is a COVID-19 special report. I'm Frontier Community Access Television Director Chris Collins. We are in the Deerfield Town Hall once again, live on all three channels to give you an update on local efforts to battle the COVID-19 pandemic. As of the numbers this morning, as we're recording this, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there are approximately 55,000 cases so far of COVID-19. There have been a number of people that have recovered from it, a number of people have died from it. We are here to give you an idea of the local efforts to battle the pandemic and keep everybody in the South County safe. Joining me in the Deerfield Town Hall today are Deerfield Police Chief John Pachorek, Deerfield Select Board Member Carolyn Shores Ness, and South County EMS Director Zach Smith. Folks, welcome. We are properly distanced in terms of the social uh, distancing protocol. Uh, and I wanted to get a chance, it's been a couple of weeks since we've had an update. Obviously, based on the numbers that we're seeing, uh, the COVID pandemic in Massachusetts is in its peak right now. Uh, John, let's start with you. Uh, an update on the police department's perspective. How are things going and what are you working on right now? Sure, so staffing wise, we're still doing pretty well right now. Uh, we've had a couple concerns, a couple people out right now. Uh, personal protection equipment wise, we're, uh, we're very well off thanks to Eagle Brook and Deerfield Academy. They have had parents worldwide shipping equipment in here and they've, uh, they've donated to myself and other agencies in town as well as South County EMS. Some of the issues that we're seeing right now, Chris, are, are not shocking to any of us. Mental health issues are on the rise. I think people are stressed, people are nervous, uh, people's anxieties are kicking. So we are dealing with a, a few more mental health cases than we have been in the recent past. Alcohol we do see is contributing factor to a lot of it. Right now, Massachusetts is just shy of 3,000 deaths. So we're still, uh, still staffed at two people 24 seven. The police department's functioning very well. And that's about it for us. I talked to one of your counterparts, uh, Chief Hague in Greenfield. Sure. He was actually at a press briefing recently. And he indicated that Deerfield, or Greenfield being centralized, they were getting a lot of prisoners coming in. They were being held in Greenfield from smaller communities. And that there's issues with trying to get restraining orders, court actions because this, of the skeleton crew at the jail and at the courthouses. Has Deerfield had that similar kind of a problem? Yeah, we've obviously run into it where we have had to apply for restraining orders and what's called the 258E um, order after hours. And they're always a concern, but we just work through the process the way we always have. We had a, uh, an arrest this weekend that was a domestic. With a domestic, there's a six hour hold and that person was transported to Greenfield Police Department and bailed at seven o'clock that following morning. So we were lucky Greenfield was able to take them for us, but I also told my midnight guys, don't be afraid to hold them here if we have to. The concern arises where you have a prisoner that's held indefinitely to a dangerousness hearing with a violent crime, and all of a sudden they're doing a remote dangerousness hearing at Greenfield PD on video conference with police officers and we're not court officers, we're not clerks of the court, we're not judges, but yet we, are, we find ourselves now taking on additional responsibilities of all kinds of people all throughout, not only the criminal justice system, but also mental health caseworkers. We've gone to residents and picked up uh, portable breathalyzers that monitor people at home for the probation department. We are doing so many different jobs in so many different capacities now that uh, I think a lot of chiefs are feeling pulled in different directions. That was the indication that I got from talking to Robbie. In terms of domestic violence cases, the indication he had was that there was, hasn't been a spike, but there have been more than usual. What's Deerfield's numbers look like? I actually uh, ran, I'm the police representative to Shelburne Control, the oversight committee for 24 communities for the regional dispatch center. I ran the numbers at the request of a few different agencies out there. And I looked at January 1st, 2019 to really middle April, 2020. And what I saw with the numbers is that they constantly fluctuated. Last April of last year, countywide between disturbances and domestics, there was like 49. Halfway through April, we were already at 28. So like I explained to a couple people out there, five or 10 additional incidents, when you look for a percentage number, can show a slight spike in them. But five over a 30 day period of 24 communities is not a lot. So we have to be very careful in our wording when we actually look at the numbers. There's been no spike. And I mean, Robbie's spot on as usual. 
And we should also mention that you're doing all this extra stuff while still maintaining regular shifts, while still doing your patrols, still doing all the things that you normally do. So it's, it's really got to be a very difficult situation for any agency, especially a police department. Yeah, I think the hardest one for us right now, believe it or not, is actually just pistol permits. It's the license That's to carry. Right. Yeah. It's having people mail it in, get a, a check from them, get a photo that works in the Merck's database that we can upload into the system, and then schedule them later on for fingerprints when we don't even know when we can get them in. And then what we've also seen uh, is the opposite side of it, where people are genuinely nervous. Again, their anxiety's kicking. We see people with uh, criminal records in the, in the past that have never even thought about applying for a pistol permit because they don't think they're eligible, right. and now they're coming in and they want to apply. And we are caught in this predicament where we can't take new applicants because they absolutely have to be fingerprinted, and it's really a matter of what do you do? What's, what's the best course of action for the residents? The last thing you want to do is violate somebody's Second Amendment rights and tell them, hey, you can't apply for a gun permit, or by the way, we're going to deny you or we're going to issue it we are just in this awkward, awkward position right now. I mean, it's no different than we get a call of a religious event this weekend, and there's 50 people gathered at a local church. Can we enforce that? Some people are going to say, absolutely. Uh, the Attorney General is, the United States Attorney General is going to say, absolutely not. That's a violation of their First Amendment rights. So. There's a massive conflict going across the whole nation of what we can do and what we can't do. So there are calls to my phone once in a while going, hey, this is a slippery slope. Where are we at with this? Yeah, and, and we're making those decisions. I mean, this is completely uncharted territory. We, we don't have never seen this, as, as has been pointed out numerous times. And, and Carolyn brought this up in their last brief, and I want to bring Carolyn Shores Ness in. Uh, the only comparison is the 1918 pandemic, which we don't have a lot of, of data on other than, you know, historical documents. Um, and, th and this is only the first wave of this. So we have to recognize that as bad as this seems right now, it could get much worse. Um, yes. I just have to caution people that this is really, I mean, the situation is not stabilized. You um, talked about cases increasing and deaths still happening. And um, this is a long-term disruption. I know people, as John mm -hmm. alluded to, and Zach sees, um, this is, uh, people are frustrated, they're angry, they're upset, they're anxious, um, they're worried. And we just, you know, this is like, I hate to say a sports, sports analogy, but this is, you know, second inning of a nine-inning game. We're just at the beginning, and people have to hang in there. We're, we're all in this together. We can do it. We can figure it out. But we just have to um, have patience and stay home. What are some of the efforts happening in Deerfield right now regarding the pandemic? What, what actions are the Board of Health taking specifically as you are a member of the Board of Health as well? Well, we're, we're trying to do more. Uh, we're thinking of, of doing a robocall and, and doing a flyer and having outreach and um, making sure we're not missing anyone in the community. That's my worry. I, I, I don't want anyone to feel isolated and not. Um, not be aware of them uh, and see if we can help them. Um, but I think one of the things that we did, we did have an additional case over the weekend, and um, we're trying to work with uh, the state on the um, community tracing collaborative. Uh, what happened is um, originally um, up until Thursday, the state was using the red caps, which was volunteer academic and students um, doing the tracing statewide, uh, contact tracing. If there was a case, then um, that they were the help to back up the local boards of health. So we, um, as of the 23rd Thursday, this past Thursday, it switched over the Partners in Health nonprofit that is a worldwide um, public health entity is teaming up with the state to do this community tracing collaborative. Mm -hmm. So we volunteered our case because we knew the person and and we knew it was 100% under control. And um, just because it wasn't in the system, we were completely aware. And um, so we volunteered uh, that case to be done with the community tracing um, collaborative. And they supposedly have a supervisor for the three counties, Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden. And they have local um, people assigned to us. So it was a little slow. Um, 
supposedly it got picked up on Saturday. So that was a 24 hour period. And then um, it's being worked on right now. Whereas normally in the system, we get notification, we're on it. And we fill in all the, you know, uh, it, Lisa White, our public health nurse, myself, we're, you know, we know what's going on. We've done outreach. We already know what's happening. So I'm not pleased with the speed of this. Right. But in all, in all truth, it's just starting up. So I'm hoping that this is going to be when we get a relationship and we get up to working with them that we'll feel comfortable doing this because this is a huge, huge economic burden. As we open up and cases um, happen more, it's very, very labor intensive to do um, that kind of tracing. And certainly if the schools open up in the fall and, and we have more outbreaks, it's way beyond anything we can handle locally, even on a volunteer basis, on a, even though we can get more volunteers to help, it's going to be too much for us. So we've got to make this work. The and key word in that sentence, by the way, is if, because at this point, all bets are off as to what, it's going yes. to be, what the new normal is going to be moving forward. I want to ask you about mask policy, because some communities are requiring now people to wear masks when going out in public into stores, into essential businesses. Um, some have mandated it and some have advised it. Does Deerfield have a policy regarding masks in public places? Well, what we're doing is we're working with our businesses so that the employees of the businesses have the masks and um, we're encouraging the public to wear a mask. But uh, as a matter of fact, this morning on our um, uh, four town emergency call, we were talking about a mask policy because to be effective and and really um, make it work. We want to have uh, the, the four towns, Sunderland, Waitley, Conway, and Deerfield have a combined um, policy. We as Board of Health and the Select Board, we give permits to businesses. So actually, we've had 100% cooperation with our businesses. That's Nobody great. wants to have a hassle with, it's not that we would say that we're gonna give you a permit problems, but if you weren't cooperative, I certainly would not be so interested in renewing your permits when you come to us and, uh, and before us um, at renewal time. So our businesses have been very cooperative because they've wanted to and, and we really haven't had any issues even though we have a relatively a big stick um, for most businesses. So it's really getting the public to understand that the majority of the transmission seems to be happening through droplets and wearing a mask or a face covering, you don't necessarily need a mask, but you need a face covering with um, you know, some kind of thread count that will actually block it. And Zach probably has more information, uh, technical information on that, but it's, it's important to have, to wear a mask if you can, or a face covering um, if we're gonna continue to operate. One of the things that we talked about before we went on the air was that there seems to be a hesitance, and we'll go to Zach Smith about this, uh, of people to call 911 when they're actually sick. That's actually resulted in deaths of people who have not been willing to call 911 in, in clinical situations where they might have been saved otherwise. What do you have on that, Zach? Thanks, Chris. Uh, we've seen this nationally, aside from just locally. We, our call volume is down precipitously at South County EMS. And a lot of that we attribute to our public health efforts to make sure people kind of triage themselves and they don't call 911 unless they absolutely need it. And we always encourage people to call their primary care wherever they receive health care first uh, for consultation. That said, both locally and nationally, we've seen that people are very hesitant to call 911 and also to go to the emergency room. They're, they're afraid that that is where the sick people are and they will catch COVID. Right. Um, I want to preface this by saying we still would like people to triage themselves, take an inventory, see whether they're having a true medical emergency or not. Um, but we have capacity and we can respond to emergencies if somebody is having a medical emergency. And I want people to know that um, if they think they're having a medical emergency, they should call 911. We can come and we can respond and we are wearing masks. We will give the patient a mask and the hospital is taking many efforts to make sure that it is safe for everybody to be in the emergency room. So while the 
risk would seem like it's, it's greater by going to the hospital. Everybody is working very, very diligently to make sure that it is safe if you're having a medical emergency. So do not hesitate to call 911 if you are having an emergency. We will come, we will respond, and we will help you through that decision process and take you where you need to go. It's always tough to battle perception and to battle a belief. And, and, I, and I've talked to people who have been afraid to go to the ER. And, and if somebody is hesitant, should they call South County EMS even as, for a question instead of just 911? I mean, are you guys available to be open for anybody to call that has a medical concern? I, legally, regulatorily wise, we're not allowed to give medical advice. That, that's a conversation somebody should have with their primary care. Um, and, and as I said before, they can also give you information in the context of your individual medical history. If you are unsure, if you cannot reach your primary care, if, you, if you're not sure whether you're having a medical emergency, calling 911 is appropriate and we can respond. We can't give you advice one way or the other, but we can help weigh options. We can talk about what our assessments are telling us or not telling us, and we might be able to assuage some fears that somebody might have going to the emergency room. There's I, the fear of contracting COVID is no reason to stay at home and suffer needlessly or even die from something that would have been survivable had you just called 911. When this pandemic first hit, the advice was to call your primary care physician. And the primary care physician could tell you whether to go to the hospital or not. And once again, we have to remember that this, this thing preys on older people and people with a compromised immune systems. But what we've seen lately is a lot of young people getting it, a lot more incidents of strokes, of heart-related issues among people that would ordinarily be considered relatively healthy, which is, I think, a scary thing as well, is it not? Yeah, I, absolutely. And that's part of kind of the unknown why it's all the more important to reach out to medical professionals if you have questions. What we've also seen from this is this push towards telehealth and, you know, like FaceTiming with your doctor or something like that. There's a lot of things that have happened on the back end to allow that to occur regulatory-wise, that laws that were in place that were preventing it previously are now gone. So there are ways that you can be assessed by your own doctor's office remotely, and they can ask questions, and they can interview, and you can, you can actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. And they are still always the best avenue for your general medical questions. But you're right. It, we, if, you, if you're having symptoms that you're not sure about, you really should seek medical care um, or at least um, expertise. And, and in some cases, that'll still be 911. Carolyn, in terms of, a, of the Board of Health's perspective, you mentioned earlier that you know, the permitting thing is one thing, but are you, you guys are doing regular checks on the local businesses to ensure that they're adhering to these social distancing guidelines? Yes. Um, Dick is out all the time. He's looking at, he's r requiring uh, cleaning journals. So he's looking at the protocol that's happening for cleaning, making sure that people are actually doing it. Um, things are getting wiped down regularly. Um, businesses are reaching out to us and, and asking for best practices, things like that. So there, there really is good communication and good follow-up. And we had mentioned the last time, John, talking about efforts to help seniors and shut-ins. I know your mom is very involved mm -hmm. with the Senior Center. Anything new to report on that front? No, I know um, over the weekend, I think one of the days they did nearly 120 meals in one day. And I think today they were at like 56 or 58. So the meal program's working out very well. I know the phone calls are still going out, even uh, with the phone call this morning, that was a question. The phone calls are still going out and the seniors are lonely out there. They're home, they're bored, and they want somebody to talk to. So people are spending hours and hours on the phone with them, but it's all good, it's all positive. Yeah, and if they have any needs, we're trying to address them as fast as we can. Yeah. And the telephone and the reaching out over the phone is so important, not just with seniors, but in, you know, with your own loved ones mm -hmm. and everything else. I know that there's been a lot of concern, at least at the federal level, about the economic impact of this thing. My concern is more the local stories and the local towns and, and how they're going to weather this unprecedented sort of tsunami. How is Deerfield's budget looking presently and looking into 2021? I mean, does it look like you're going to have a huge budget gap? Well, I mean, truthfully, we have always been very conservative. So... Um, and, and we've collected most of our revenues up to this point for this coming year. So um, 
it's not bad at the moment. And um, I think we're all concerned about what's going to happen, not in this budget year, but the following budget year, um, because it trickles down from the federal level to the state level and then to us. And we're always the last, you know, the buck stops here kind of thing. Um, and, and this is similar to the financial crisis that we had. It wasn't that year, it was the following year that was most difficult. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can cut our budget right now. Um, but I think uh, because of the lockdown and we don't really know how we're gonna manage uh, getting people to a town meeting, um, we're just going to approve our budget and um, then revisit it in the fall. And we're gonna have to do this probably on a monthly, if not, I mean quarterly for sure, but look at our expenditures versus our revenues. So we're talking about a one twelfth budget probably to start the fiscal mm, year? I'm not really interested to do that because that's <laughs> seemingly... It's I mean, a reporting that's like, nightmare. Right, yeah. it's a reporting nightmare. So we're going to approve our budget, but we as internally, the Finance Committee, Capital Improvement, and Select Board, we're going to work together with the schools, which is the biggest, you know, 70% of our budget, trying to figure out what we're going to do. But I think we're all concerned because... What happens is the government, I mean, when I first was elected selectman, um, Mitt Romney uh, had nine C cuts where he cut the reimbursement for the elementary school. And that was like, oh my gosh, that, that I mean, that was the state had guaranteed us, you know, a percentage back for the elementary school. And to cut that, how can you do that? That's like, so my experience with nine C cuts is very, very, I'm just nervous about it. And it, I think, uh, Charlie Baker is wonderful because he's ha he's been a selectman before versus other governors, so he knows how the impact of nine C cuts on the local level are. But he's going to be also have no control based on what's happening on the federal level. Right. And what's happening on the federal level is kind of nerve wracking. We have a very high ratio, highest since World War II, of debt to our GDP, our do gross domestic product. But also we have one of the lowest revenue collections to our GDP. So the tax, uh, the amount of revenue coming into the government before COVID was extremely you know, even though we had a good economy and, I mean, there, it, the, it was the federal iffy. government was headed to big problems right. because it wasn't being managed correctly. And so you had the COVID situation where money is just like a fire hose coming out. You know, our debt, I'm not so worried about it because it's, you know, we got an emergency, we got to deal with it. But, you know, we still have to have some kind of balance on the federal level. And I, I have to say I'm, I don't have a lot of faith in the, current um, group in Washington. So we're gonna have to do something um, long-term and that's gonna have an impact on the state and then that will have an impact on us. And, and so all I can say is that Deerfield will continue to be extremely conservative. We will watch our dollars like we have always done. Um, we'll try to hustle to get projects paid for other ways. Um, I'm convinced that there's gonna be infrastructure projects because we haven't, we've had four years of no infrastructure projects. So that's one way to always kickstart the economy. So we need to have projects ready. We got the sewer treatment plant, we got culverts, we got a lot of engineering done that we've invested. We're in a much better position than we were in the financial crisis when that came, um, that infrastructure project came out. So I'm, I'm hoping that we're gonna end up being okay. Um, we're gonna try work really hard. We have an excellent select uh, board. Um, Dave and Trevor and I work together really well for the first time in oh, so long. We have a full staff, Casey and Jen in the, our Slugman's office, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I think we're, have, we're in a good position, I think. I think right now it's the fear of the unknown. Yes. We just, we want the final numbers so we can start planning. Yeah. And we can all sit down and work together as a core group. Yeah, it's right now, it's just the fear of the unknown. Okay, what, what, how's the state gonna be impacted? How are we? We know people buy less new cars, and one of the major tax collections that we see in Deerfield is, is excise, excise tax. tax. Absolutely. Exactly. Hotel yeah. and, and meal tax, and meal tax is gonna be down. Uh, hotel tax should be relatively okay. The red roof has been relatively well occupied. So 
We'll, uh, we'll see how we shake out in that area. The excise tax is the one that we always watch. Um, we're very conservative. Again, we use a rolling five-year average. Um, I've refused to um, allow us to, you know, really anticipate how much we have had when, in good years. And um, it's, I think it's paid off. We're, I think we'll be okay. I mean, people still have to have reasonable vehicles. And, and this is different than the financial... Uh, crisis in the sense that, that it, it is a public health. Um, but the problem is there's no vaccine, and we're not going back to normal until we have a vaccine. And people need to get over it. It's not happening in the next few months. You know, when the administration comes on and says it's the rearview mirror is in Memorial Day, and, you know, you're going to have to do some social distancing to the summer. I'm sorry. It's going to be a year at least. And we need to be practical about it. So how can we conduct business and be safe? And we just have to figure that out. Th those comments are probably more about political self-preservation than they are about public health and safety. I wanted to ask John, um, have you had any instances where you've seen large groups congregating where you've had to go in and break up gatherings or not? No, we've been very fortunate in Deerfield. Yeah. Nope. We've That's been good. very lucky. Yeah, I mean, people in Deerfield are amazing. We have great residents. I haven't even heard of problems in Waitley, Sunderland, or Conway. I mean, South County's amazing. Yeah. Zach, any final thoughts before we wrap things up here in terms of public safety and how people should comport themselves and how you're going to move forward? How's your staffing levels? Staffing's uh, fine. We, every day when our staff comes in, we do a, a self-check and an attestation, and my staff don't come in if they're feeling unwell, but everybody's feeling well. They're all here. I would say for the general public, wash your hands, um, wear a mask when you go out in public, and that is a way of, we call it um, source control, but it's just, it keeps kind of your own spit from leaving your immediate area. So I always wear a mask when I leave, either on duty or off duty, and, um, and, and rely on your sources, good sources, know your sources, Centers for Disease Control, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, mass.gov, town of Deerfield, uh, ma. whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, the website. Um, know where you're getting your information, listen to the experts, and uh, seek help if you need it. And don't throw your rubber gloves on the ground either. That's been a big thing lately. People are just discarding stuff like that. You don't want to do that. Yeah, I John think the big thing that we need to focus on, if we want to jump in for a second, Chris, sure. is the testing. And Carolyn's touched on this repeatedly yeah. over and over again. We still need to ramp up testing Massachusetts, and we're leading the forefront of it for the country. But, you know, countrywide, worldwide, we need to ramp up testing, including the antibody test. Because most people were floored when they realized that New York City randomly sampled 3,000 people in a grocery store and found 14.8% already tested positive oh. for the antibodies. God. So if they equated that out to New York's populace, just in general, and the number's not solid by any means, but just in general, it equated to 2.7 million people have already been exposed in the state of New York, and we don't even know it. We are literally, and people all the time say, why can't we get tested yet? We're six weeks in. Exactly. We are expecting immediate results, and like Carolyn said, this is a marathon. We're six weeks in. We've got to get, give them time to validate it. Well, to date... The country's had about 4 million tests, countrywide. It, the Harvard study that just came out said we have to be doing at least 5 million tests a day. A day. And we've not even gotten that amount for the, In total. In total. So we've got to figure out a way, testing, testing, testing. And the reason why it's test, you need to test, is because, like John said, you, got, you have to identify the people that have some antibodies. Now, again, there are so many unknowns about this virus. We don't know how much immunity, do you, if, if you have enough antibodies mm -hmm. to be immune. But certainly the people that have had some exposure, and that, that percentage could be skewed a little bit. You have to watch out on statistics because they were taking you know, people at a grocery store. You, if you add the total population, you've got all the people that are sheltering in place that never go anywhere. And it's the one person that is of the household that's going out constantly. So, again, we have no idea. And, mm -hmm. the, and the having the unknowns is what's incredibly hard to make really good decisions as a, as a government, and whether you're local or state. And so I'm hoping that we'll get more tests and the test will show the antibodies when who has had it. 
and who's been exposed and has a lesser, a lesser of a risk. At some point, we'll know what the antibody test means as far as how many antibodies do you have. I mean, how, do you have enough antibodies when you're deathly sick and have pneumonia, or you just have a little sore throat or a headache and that's it? And, you know, is that going to give you enough protection? We don't know. Um, so we have to sort that through. And, but like I said, this is a long haul. Uh, hopefully we're going to have tests and, we'll, and we're going to be able to test people um, so that we can start going on a, a, the new normal. We should also point out that there are a number of people, a lot of people who have tested positive who have recovered. Mm -hmm. But the number that was sobering for me that I saw today was in six weeks, almost as many people in this country have died of this virus as died in the entire Vietnam War. And that, that to me sort of brings it home. I mean, it's just, I'm talking about Americans now. I mean, obviously that war killed a lot more people than just Americans. But 58,000 people died in the Vietnam War. And I think the number today I heard was like 56, 55 around there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is nothing to play with, obviously. Yeah, and it just, we have, I mean, you worry about the kids that have been vaping and that are sheltering in place now. You know, once they go out, if they get exposed. No one's really talked about that. But, you know, they've had impairments on their lungs. And so are they more susceptible and you know, to a, a worse case exposure, even though they're very young. So, I mean, I, from a, being a mom or a grandmother, I, you know, you worry about that kind of stuff when we think about opening up our schools. How, how are we going to protect our kids as well, you know? Yep, and, and but, as, as we know, the schools are closed in Massachusetts for the rest of the year. Remote learning is in place at Frontier and other schools, and... Um, I'm assuming we're going to open in the fall, but at this point, we don't know. I mean, there's no, there's no sort of game plan here because there can't be. This is a moving target. Well, there's no national strategy. So when there's no national strategy, states are making independent decisions. And unfortunately, um, you know, you just have to make the – I feel confident, confident in Charlie Baker. So um, if we do open the schools, it will be based on scientific data. But – I also think that unless we get the testing situation sorted out and we get this contact tracing sorted out, it's not going to happen. And one of the things that people can do is, um, you know, I, 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 there's no, like, happy part of this, but um, this is historic. So all the kids that are home, they could be writing about this because when we have our 400th anniversary, uh, people will be interviewing you and want to know. And so how about get your kids to write about this? But also, we need to practice because one of the things that's going to be very critical is contact, um, you know, can you talk to the person um, about who their contacts were in two, two days, 48 hours before you had symptoms or you were exposed. Honestly, over the years, the only... Um, real experience I've had with this is, is doing food poisoning cases where you've had, you know, trying to get people to remember what they ate. Let me tell you, it's pretty tough. Yeah. So reminding, you know, trying to remember who you had contact with. Well, this is with having contact for more than 10 or 15 minutes within six feet of each other. Who, who have you had contact for the last 48 hours before you had any symptoms? Um, so people need to just start practicing that. Write that down. Think about it. If you happen to go out that day, um, who, who beyond your household did you run into? And that's the kind of thing that um, I think we all need to practice. And um, where we in South County, and I say because we're trying to act together as the four towns, um, not only because our schools are set up that way, but just in our ambulance service, but just because we are um, used to working together. Um, I think if we have people really practice this, we will be able to move ahead as, as, as South County. So it's really critical that people start thinking about contact, just listing their contacts for that day somewhere little to-do pad. To, you know, I have lists now all the time. You know, I'm getting old, so I have to re write everything down. So when you're writing down what you're supposed to be doing, also write down who did you see that day yeah. and, and, and try to make it a habit because in the fall, if we open up school, this is going to be critical. 
absolutely critical. And we need to be able to think about that and be helpful to whoever is calling you looking for your contacts 48 hours before you had any symptoms. And that's going to be tough, a little tough for most people. I want to thank you all for your efforts. Thank you for being here today for this update. Zach Smith from South County EMS, John Pachorik, Police Chief in Deerfield, Carolyn Shores-Ness from the Deerfield Select Board and Board of Health. I'm Chris Collins. That's been an FCAT special report, COVID-19, your local response. We'll talk to you next time for all of us here at FCAT. Have a good day.